It's time for a return to some Koresh lore here today, and we're going to be talking about two of the new units that the Koresh um, fan project have put out. Now, the Panaga Cobra Sam deck here is um, one that they put out about two weeks ago, and they're putting out this new one here that they've given me um, both the art and the lore ahead of time to make this video for you guys so you can see it on their world anvil i'm going to put a link to that in the description and in the pinned comment so please go and check them out they have been doing an amazing job bringing this fan project this fan lore for koresh to life so what we're going to do today is just like we do with normally when it comes to like any legendary lord speculation video we're going to read the lore that they've created first then speculate a little bit about it about how it could possibly be brought into a total war game and then we're going to go into this, the uh, other unit and do the exact same thing so I'll be showing off the art here, um, and again, you can find all the relevant information and the links to them in the uh, comment and the I'm sorry, pinned comment and the description. They have put in so much work into this, guys. So please go and check them out. But let's start here on the lore for the Panaga Cobra Sam deck. We're gonna do this a little low tech, so you guys can kind of read along with me. The Panaga comprise the highest caste among snakemen, and the mightiest among them naturally make up the generals and war leaders of the snakemen armies. The Cobra Samdek, or chieftains, are the enforcers of the blood Naga Queen's will, leading the serpent hosts to battle where the Naga are disinclined to show or preoccupied elsewhere. Enhanced with chaos energies, these mighty four-armed beings are possessed of a keen intellect, quick reflexes, and vicious fighting prowess. Eldest of their kind, the Cobra Samdek only gets stronger with age and can only be slain by violence. These lords among the snake men are supremely dexterous and capable of wielding three or four deadly weapons simultaneously, all coated in venom lethal enough to kill with a scratch. Long millennia of combat and supernatural balance have given the Panaga a fighting style that is mystifying in its coordination. Ensorcelled great crescent warp stone axes or mach halberds are swung in tandem with parung blades or the chris and karambit daggers. It is not uncommon to see these leaders effortlessly engaging multiple opponents at once, butchering those who manage to break through the longer reach of their pole arms with their shorter blades before feasting on the resulting gore. The Naja chieftains are possibly even deadlier combatants, for they also exhibit the venom-spitting ability of the Naja caste. Faced with a particularly strong foe or prey they would rather capture, the Kobrasam deck will weaken the target with a hypnotizing gaze and hissing reverberation. This tends to reduce the chieftain's combat awareness and distracts them from leading their forces, so they tend to employ hypnotism at the closing stages of a battle or when their victim is isolated. Those especially vexing to the Cobra Sam deck may find themselves constricted with muscular tails and subjected to a slow, asphyxiating death of pulped organs, burst eyes, and crushed bone. When not slithering into battle, the Cobra Chieftains can be found commanding their hosts from atop one of the Ratha chariots pulled by the devolved Araga Lizardmen, or atop the hulking Makor. Some ancient and accomplished leaders have even been known to fly atop the arcane Viminaga arcs, dictating the flow of battle at bird's eye view while engaging airborne threats and opposing leaders. Another curious trait of the Cobra Samdek is their unconscious ability to absorb magical energies that permeate the environment into their bodies, taking on traits associated with the winds of magic as the ages pass. Lateradano, the commanding Panaga general of the Ebonstone Marga from Warpstone-saturated Southern Koresh, has been infused with enough dar that his scales have turned a shiny coal black interspersed with nacreous hues, while his necrotic venom causes wounds that cannot be healed with magic and imbue horrific mutations on his prey. Satra King Toxikil, Panaga leader of the Amaranthian Lotus Marga, is so suffused with the red wind of Akshi that his red-hot scales smoke and crackle like embers, while his weapons spontaneously catch fire in combat and immolate enemies that make contact with them. 
And that right there is a pretty spicy lore for what would be a generic lord option for the Koresh army. Now, this would be just a simply, uh, I guess you could kind of compare it from the High Elf roster. This would be your High Elf Prince, right? Your generic Lord option, more of a combatant, absolutely not a caster. But we do get some kind of smatterings of casting or at least uh, um, a suffusion of magic into these chieftains at at least the level of like, okay, hey, they get imbued with some winds of magic and that might equate to some things. So let's talk about this from a Total War perspective because there's a lot to really dive into. We've got this um, association, right? Taking on traits associated with the winds of magic as the ages passed. So perhaps you can have different versions of these guys where they get a bound ability or maybe they just get perhaps like... Um, a different version of the lore attribute, or maybe they just get the lore attribute of a specific wind. And that way, anytime a spell is cast of that like conjunction, like say, hey, my guy is for Akshi, so that's gonna be fire. So I also have a fire caster, and I'm gonna double up on the lore of um, fire from that ability. Like th that would be a probably a pretty cool one, but it also would be very temperamental and it'd be extremely situational. So I think just giving it simply a bound ability or maybe it gives them, hey, Akshi, so they all get um, any lore that is suffused with that wind gets flaming attacks or maybe something of Dar <clears throat> gets sundered attacks, something of the sort where it can either, it gives the the unit some sort of ability, some sort of just kind of passive that's always there. I think it would be really cool to give these a little bit of a different um, cut above the other Koresh. Now, even looking at the mount options, we can see that this thing can be, I don't want to say on foot, I guess on snake, on, on tail. Then we see the Ratha chariot pulling this with the Uraga lizard men or atop the hulking Makor, which is essentially, uh, it's a disgusting beast, and I can't wait until they show it to you guys, but it's an elephant merworm cone snail hybrid. Um, it's got a big hadab on its back. It's a, a, a mammoth. So that would be a big centerpiece model for Koresh that these guys could ride. But then further, you know, some ancient and accomplished leaders have even been known to fly atop the arcane Verminaga arcs. So we get something kind of like a Lothern sky cutter, right? Where we get a floating artillery piece that these guys could uh, man essentially, which we or snake essentially, which would be pretty damn awesome. Now, moving up to the actual mechanics of these you know we see that they've got warpstone axes that they've got these mach halberds that they've got a chris sword a karamba dagger and that's four weapons how would this kind of equate into the actual character itself and i i kind of thought about this in a number of ways for one maybe it has both anti-large and anti-infantry it's got both armor piercing attacks and poison attacks because you know it's a snake and it, the lore kind of describes that, right? It talks about having all these poisonous, venomous attacks that even a scratch could kill you. So here's my, here's my theory. You either give the unit all those things or the, the, the lord all those things. It can have anti-large and AP and anti-infantry and all that stuff. And that, that's just its profile and it just does that damage. But what would be kind of cool is if you had two buttons that you could press where, okay, the snake, the, the the chieftain, since he's got four arms and technically a halberd and the warpstone axe would, even in the drawing, he, the warpstone axe is being held with two hands. So you press one button and his weapon profile goes to anti-large, AP, and sundering armor or, or something of the sort because it's a warpstone axe. And that is his profile. He stows the karambit dagger and the chris sword. But you know what? Things are getting spicy, or maybe the target I'm going after is not a uh, hard target. It is just a bunch of infantry. Okay, I press the other button. I stow the Warpstone Axe and the Mach Halbrid and pull out the Karambit Dagger and Chris Sword. I get AP, anti-infantry, and poison attacks now because now I'm within the lethal range. I can bite things, and the Karambit Dagger and Chris Sword are going to be my main primary use. I think that would be a cooler way to do it. And I think a lot of people can look at something like that and go, oh, that's OP. But if you think of it as far as like, if you're looking from a multiplayer standpoint, point investment, if you're thinking about it from a single player standpoint, your leader and gold investment, that's a lot to have in one 
location. And if it gets killed, especially like a kid in multiplayer very quickly by getting focused down, then you've lost a huge investment. So I think that while having these things can seem like a little OP or kind of broken, it also is a high risk, high reward. Yeah, sure, you've got this very cool, very strong um, single entity, but it runs the risk of getting killed and soloed out quicker. So it kind of has a self-balancing nature to the the nature of it. And especially with Total War Warhammer 3, having the new wound mechanic for single entities, that could be even more devastating to the long-term longevity of this creature. One other thing I want to talk about before we move into the other um, unit for today is the the hypnotizing. Let me get that part here. So, faced with a particularly strong foe or prey, they would rather capture the Cobra Chieftain will weaken the target with a hypnotizing gaze and hissing reverberation. So, this would be interesting as another bound ability that you activate it and maybe in a cone in front rather than a full 360 because, okay, if you're behind the snake, it's not going to make much sense to be hypnotized or it's a single target hypnotizing. And when you do it, it will slow the opponent down, lower their melee defense because they're hypnotized. They're less likely to want to try and block or dodge. And it, and it can only be used on single entities below a certain percentage of health, like if it's a single target. That way, okay, I can close the distance. I can do the damage. I can kill the thing. But the caveat to it is that it causes a leadership reduction in a 30-meter aura around it. Because remember, it says, this tends to reduce the chieftain's combat awareness and distracts them from leading their forces. So they tend to employ hypnotism at the closing stages of a battle or when their victim is isolated. So um, maybe it reduces speed by 66% and it reduces melee defense for both the chieftain and the target by like 15 or 20 and it reduces the um leadership around so it's a really again a high risk high reward i'm really doing a lot of damage to this single entity i'm almost killed their lord he's about to run away i'm going to pop this ability i'm going to really go all in to try and bring him down he's not going to be able to get away from me i would assume these guys would have somewhat of a, a decent speed on them even if they're on foot and this is the way you kind of close that gap and finish them off. I think it's a really cool kind of executioner style uh, move that you get from like, you know, World of Warcraft Warrior, execute. This is the same thing here by being able to hypnotize, slow them down, finish them off with either your um, axe and halberd or your dagger and sword. Let's jump into our other unit for today and do some more lore reading. Before we actually jump in, take a look at this disgusting creature you're about to see throughout this entire narrative piece. It's disgusting. Kobal Yu is a master of creating things that make me lose my appetite. So let's go ahead and jump into the information here, the lore on the Krasarb Haruspex. Out of all creations of the Blood Naga, the Krasarb Haruspex, the gut eaters, the faces of disgrace, the plague revenants, is perhaps their most infamous and most revolting, bearing an appearance so visceral it forever scars the minds of mortal onlookers and drives the weak-willed to retching deaths. The Krasarb's basic form is a large, floating, vaguely human or elven head, trailing mutated appendages of exposed organs and offal that ooze with slime and pus, with some terminating in writhing serpents. Its jaw is distended and its mouth is filled with huge incisors that drip with gore. Long, slime-matted dark hair drifts in the air as if the creature is underwater. A large, elongated, toothy feeding proboscis, like a mutated tongue in the shape of a lamprey, emerges from its yawning maw. It is able to use its appendages like hideous tentacles to grasp and manipulate objects and other beings, and many are covered with further mutations that produce barbs, scales, spines, eyes, more jaws, and strange filaments that secrete a cloud of gas that obscures their forms. What seem like gaudy ornaments attached to the Krasarb Haruspex's head are the control apparatuses of the Naga that keep their actions in check during the heat of battle. In the wilds of the hinterlands, the Krasarb is an active nocturnal carnivore, often found around the swamps, graves, and wastes of the hinterlands. It glides on the currents of the winds of magic as its keen sense of smell draws it to battlefields, slaughterhouses, and settlements with wounded soldiers or new childbirths. A severely gluttonous creature, it will fearlessly attack flesh and blood monsters that stumble into its path in an attempt to feed on their blood and entrails. 
Each meal disturbingly adds to its mass, with the older individuals growing to the size of giants. At night, the Krasar becomes luminescent, its body giving off a lambent glow of sickly green and ochre as it reflects the light of more sleep. Exposed organs, typically consisting of the heart, liver, and lungs, all pulsate with sorcerer's power. When only a certain organ beats, the Krasarb is able to remotely induce arterial ruptures, strangulation, or sadistically regenerate the injuries of its victims to perpetuate their suffering on those within close proximity. Witnesses who have merely seen the body of the Krasarb at a distance experience visions of antediluvian horror and portents of doom in their dreams. The Krasarb's deadliest aspect, however, is its ability to exude illness and rapid decomposition. Believed to bear the plague god's curse, wind blowing through the abomination's dangling appendages turn into necrotic vapors. The Krasarb can direct this gale at enemies as a billowing miasma that sickens other life forms or dissolves flesh, rots wood, and corrodes metal. Mundane weapons tend to crumble as warriors try to bring them to bear against these monsters. Youth and vigor are sapped with the merest brush of their entrails as they float through the fighting mass like ghastly sea jellies among a school of small fish. When the winds of magic swirl through Koresh, the Krasab spreads the snake-eater plague through their miasma, warping the entrails of those warm-blooded creatures caught in the clouds into swarms of snakes that excruciatingly erupt from their bodies. The Krasarb were not originally devised as such by the Naga queens. Rather, they came from Naga that had their entire bodies and minds irrevocably altered by an experiment gone astray. During the pact with the ruinous powers, the snake men defiled the sacred berries of the lost city of the Old Ones, previously used by the Slan, turning many of them into dark reservoirs of organic soup from which the brood sex carried out terrible experiments. A brood of Naga submerged themselves in these fluids and enacted a secret ritual, beseeching the dark gods for forbidden knowledge that would place them ascendant over all others of their kind. Perhaps as a result of sabotage by one of the other Naga or some capricious whim of the dark gods, these Naga were savaged by sorcerous infection and their innate hunger was magnified tenfold. They tore at their own bodies and their features metamorphosed into the likeness of the younger races which they so despised, emerging as the precursors of the Crossarb. Their considerable intellect had wasted away, leaving a formidable cursed monster of instinct and predator cunning. The Blood Naga Queens found that the Crossarb could also transmit this curse to other Naga if they consumed their putrid saliva or the severed flesh of their appendages. Worried of what they could potentially do to the entire Snakeman civilization, the ruling Blood Naga joined forces to destroy most of the original batch and found a way to bend the will of the remainder and their progeny through sacrificial rites. Now, the Krasarb plague Koresh and the surrounding lands at the pleasure of the queens, with new specimens created out of the younger Naga who have betrayed their matriarchs or transgressed against the tenets of their blood sex. Brought forth into the millennia of wars against the enemies of the Serpent Naga, the Krasarb Hauspecs have developed a particular taste for ogres. Many a man-eater have found themselves devoured by these monsters, as the Krasarb corrode their gut plates with rotting curse winds and feast on the bountiful innards underneath. <laughs> Those Hauspecs, that is some repulsive lore right there and i kind of look at these almost like a mortis engine but for koresh this floating gigantic head that seems to do damage to everything around it it exudes a miasma it has what sounds like a breath attack right it talks about this billowing miasma that that pours out from it so I think that when you look at this from a Total War perspective, you do get that Mortis engine effect, something that does perpetual damage to things as long as it is in within combat. But I also see it as having a little bit more combat ability than just, say, a Mortis engine, right? A Mortis engine, in and of itself, the damage comes from its persistent effect. And that would come here with the Haro Specs. I would expect it to constantly be doing um, damage to everything around it. It talks about decaying the swords and weapons of those around it too. So perhaps it has a reduction to melee attack. It does persistent damage. 
and its attacks have a sunder armor effect because you know mundane weapons tend to crumble as warriors try to bring them to bear against these monsters youth and vigor are sapped with the merest brush of their entrails as they float through the fighting mass like ghastly sea jellies among a school of small fish so maybe they even sap vigor as well like getting rid of these things is you know prime you want to do that fast because it's reducing vigor it's reducing melee attack it in and of itself is reducing armor because of its sundering attacks and is doing persistent damage i think that would be really cool now i thought about hey maybe the things that it, when it kills things it they explode or if you die from the persistent attacks they explode we've not quite really seen that we've seen units that have it attached themselves right when we look at the uh, death swings of some of the dwarf units like the slayers or when we take a look at the uh, high elf phoenix guard regiment of renown how they explode we have not seen something cause that you know not something that says hey you die by my weapon you explode versus say i die i explode so it seems like i don't know if we could get that added into the game i don't know if that is a possibility but i would love to see it as something like okay if you die directly from the higher specs attack then you explode just like you see from the lore here and i thought about maybe okay maybe does the persistent damage also apply to the snake men themselves that way it's something that you want to kind of almost recklessly throw into battle because it can disrupt a front line and do a lot of damage and kill things and have those things explode when they die but you don't want it too close to your lines because it might actually even corrupt and hurt your own units which is something that i thought about but uh, I think about when when it comes to like unit development and unit design, having something like that. And if you're not really mindful of it and you're and if you're not the best player in the game, you know, you don't have that level of quote unquote micro. It might actually be super frustrating to have this high cost, really cool, big centerpiece unit because I see this thing as a pretty good sizable head. Like it's disgusting. You can see the the actual frame of reference that Kobo Yu used as far as how big it is compared to a normal human and it's at least two to two and a half si times the size but to have this large unit be like oh yeah I want this thing to just float in there and do some damage oh wait why are my units dying so fast I don't understand I think it would be a little more a little too much of a challenge so I think just having it do the persistent damage and again having a bound ability where it has a breath attack would be pretty Pretty clutch and pretty, I think, on the nose for what we've seen so far with the lore here. So I'm really excited to cover more and more of the Koresh as they come out. You know, we will probably be getting another drop every two weeks, as they've said. And I'll probably be stacking these up in four-week chunks. So pretty much every month, I'll cover two of the releases rather than doing it every single time they release one. Um, we'll see. I, I might just simply say, hey, you know, People want to see it, so I'll do it every two weeks. Whatever you guys want. Let me know in the comment section below. Do you want to see more coverage of this more consistently every two weeks when they release them? Or would you rather see it uh, wrapped up every month with every four uh, weeks when they start to do those uh, uh, releases? So go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. Let me know about what you think about this lore. They are going to be reading those comments. Trust me. I know they will. And let it be known. You know, they, they are huge fans of Warhammer. Uh, the artists, the writers, that they are people from our own community. So please go and check them out and support them. Give them some love because they have been crafting a great narrative for Koresh, an awesome, awesome aesthetic for Koresh, and I'm stoked to see to see more of this. <laughs> My tongue is just not working today. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, all that fun action. But have a good one and take care.